But we're going to get going with the with the next panel, which of course is on one of our, I'd say one of the most uh, topical uh, issues of, of the day, which is uh, autonomous mobility. Uh, but we're going to specifically look at the question of safety in autonomous mobility. And for that, I'm really happy to introduce our moderator, uh, Jane Lappin. Jane is the chair of the TRB Standing Committee on Road Vehicle Automation. Um, and she's also the founder of the TRB Automation and Road Transportation Symposium, which was uh, formerly known as the Automated Vehicle uh, Symposium. So Jane was with the Toyota Research Institute, heading their public policy and uh, government affairs uh, just down the street here for about four years, and before that, a very long career with the Mobley Center, uh, which is the US DOT uh, Research and Technology Center, a, a stone's throw, almost, a, uh, from where we are right now. And it's just a tremendous resource, and we're, we're happy to have many uh, colleagues from uh, the Mobley Center with us today, uh, which is actually where Jane and I met. So, uh, we're going to try doing the microphone pass here, and one thing I'm noticing about this microphone is kind of hold it super close to, to your mouth. Okay. Over to you, Jane. Thanks a lot, John. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. All right. So um, we're going to introduce ourselves, starting with Ryan, and our self-introductions are going to be our test of how well we manage the mic and audibility. Go for it. All right. Everybody hear me? Yeah. So my name is Ryan Harrington. I'm the VP of Safety at Emotional, uh, which is a joint venture between Abzib and Hyundai. Uh, it was created in 2020. Um, prior to coming to Emotional, I was at Exponent, which is an engineering and scientific consulting firm. I did a lot of work in um, consulting for the automated vehicle industry and then in litigation related to things like ADAS technologies. Uh, prior to Exponent, I was at the US DOT and I worked with Jane at the Volpe Center for about 10 years working on um, field operational tests for ADAS technologies, uh, corporate average fuel economy standards, and I managed a group looking at policy as it relates to connected vehicles and automated vehicles. And then prior to that, I was in the auto industry as a product development engineer at Delphi Automotive Systems and Cummins Engine. So I have a, a unique background in product automotive product development, uh, regulatory, and then uh, consulting and litigation support. And I'm excited to be here with, with the other panelists. Good morning. Sound check. Can, can everyone hear Chris? Can I'm Chris Mullen, I'm Senior Director of Organizational Safety for Aurora. Uh, Aurora is a self-driving company with the mission of delivering the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, and broadly. We do this through the delivery of the Aurora driver, and that's the combination of software, hardware, and uh, support services so that we can deploy first in freight. Uh, we have trucks on the road today uh, that are delivering freight for our partners, uh, and then fast follow with ride hailing. Um, my background is biomedical engineering, um, so my first half of the career, I'm, I'm a safety nerd, 25 years plus in the industry. Um, first half of the career was with automotive OEMs, first with Nissan, and then a decade with Toyota in their technical and regulatory affairs, focused mainly on crashworthiness. Uh, from there, I went to State Farm and led their technology research division, focused on loss mitigation and prevention research for home and auto. Uh, did a brief stint in a SaaS company, uh, led their R&D for repairability of past cars up to Class A trucks, and then landed at Uber Advanced Technology Group, uh, focused on standards and analysis, which then was acquired by Aurora, that brought me to Aurora for organizational safety. Uh, there I lead the functions that are responsible for uh, safety assurance that Aurora can identify and manage safety risk. That includes the safety management system, the safety culture, policy, assurance, and risk management. Uh, the logistics facilities and operational safety and safety investigations. Uh, very excited to be here. This is going to be an awesome panel. Uh, thanks, Chris. David. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Blessing. I'm with Liberty Mutual. Uh, I co lead our mobility solutions group at Liberty, where we're looking at all things about the future of mobility and how to, how to ensure those risks and how to help our partners be safe and bring those, those solutions to the road. We work with partners like Motion and Aurora, uh, ride hailing companies, uh, vehicle subscription companies, and, and the like. Uh, I've been with Liberty for 31 years in various underwriting and finance positions. Uh, currently, uh, 
most prior to this, I was our chief operating officer for our large risk cap steel operation. Thanks, David. Let's go to the screen. Bernard, would you introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you, Jane. Hey, everybody. I'm Bernard Soriano. I'm the deputy director at the California Department of Motor Vehicles. And um, sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles where I uh, have to do a couple meetings. But uh, prior to um, uh, coming to the Department of Motor Vehicles, I worked in the aerospace industry uh, for Hughes Space and Communications where I designed attitude control systems and participated in the launch of uh, various communication satellites and military satellites. At the California DMV, I'm responsible for um, autonomous vehicles in California, and I uh, was responsible for the regulations that allow automated vehicles on our public roadways. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Bernard. And last but definitely not least, Mark, would you introduce yourself? Thanks, Jane. Uh, my name is Mark Rosekind. I'm calling in from California, Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm actually trained as a scientist, so my expertise is in human fatigue, which I did for a long time in academics and at NASA, helping to keep pilots and astronauts awake on the job. Uh, I spent seven years in Washington uh, during the Obama administration, first as a board member at the NTSB, and then as administrator at NHTSA. Uh, after that, I was the Chief Safety Innovation Officer at Zoops, and for about a month now, I am the first uh, CEO at the California Mobility Center. Uh, which is an organization that's focused on enhancing safety, sustainability, and equity through new mobility innovations. Great to be here. Keep your mic on. Um, our focus today is AB safety assurance. But before we launch into that primary topic, we've got to tear the shade off that Ford put over the whole industry when it pulled out of Argo. Um, Chris Mullins, boss. Chris Ernson at Aurora instantly posted a blog um, expressing sympathy for the Aurora team, but asserting that this is not judgment on the industry overall, that in fact it's strong, the horizon is clear, and I would say that this consolidation opens up some uh, wiggle room for less competition for engineers, less competitions for venture capital, Ryan, you work at Motional. You all are certainly uh, competing for great engineers in the workplace. What did you all say to one another behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't speak on the specifics of, of Ford and Argo. Um, I will say that as an industry, um, you know, bringing in diverse perspectives, right? We got, you know, automated vehicles is a very complicated task from an engineering perspective, a human machine interface, a customer acceptance. So. Bringing in multiple perspectives and experiences is important. So, um, you know, consolidation happens when you have emerging technologies, and obviously, uh, there's some great engineers, scientists at Argo, and so you know, being able to pull in some of those uh, expertise, I think, is going to help you know overall industry. Obviously, you know, um, you feel for the folks that uh, don't have jobs, um, but um, I think there is an opportunity to, to cross pollinate in something that is, uh, you know, as complicated as uh, complex as automated vehicles. That, Getting that expertise from, from other different um, companies is, I think, is going to be uh, beneficial in moving the ball forward. Chris, it, there were your bosses, Armson and Sterling, who rushed to blog about the impact and the meaning of this. I wonder if there are any other insights um, that you could share about you know, what this means for the future of our, of our technology. It should come as no surprise, I agree with my bosses uh, on this, um, about the value and the opportunity in the longer term picture. Um, you know, some of the opening remarks talking about the number of fatalities from, from upwards of 43,000. There are certainly safety benefits that will come from the deployment, the successful deployment of this technology. Um, companies change direction for all kinds of reasons, and, and I agree with Chris. There's a value proposition here that we are keen to address. Um, that's why we're, we're looking at trucking first. There are a uh, shortage of 80,000 drivers and growing in the U.S. There's an unmet need for um, filling those routes. And we look forward to doing that. And I agree with Ryan that the, the uh, competition for talent is, is very difficult. And we're going to need everybody on this. Um, you know, Progress Bernard mentioned multiple safety critical industries that current transportation initiatives need to take advantage of. And our, our team is, is stacked. We've got 
folks from uh, you know, rail, aerospace, uh, automotive, of course, medical devices, insurance. You're going to need every safety critical best practice in order to address the challenges that we're, we're uh, addressing with automated technology. And I, I think there's an incredible opportunity. And you know, the, the consolidation will bring changes, but there'll, there'll be good changes for um, for what we're, we're going after. So. Uh, nothing but, but looking up in this case, and the, the sympathy you mentioned from Chris, this is a small industry. Uh, we have friends in these in these companies. We have colleagues that we've worked, for, uh, worked with for years. Um, so that, that's sad in the moment, and, and we're, we're um, you know, sympathetic to that, uh, but we're going to keep going forward. Mark, let me ask you, um, Zoots was purchased by Amazon, and I, I would say that the nice thing about that alliance is the shared focus on a far horizon. What do you think that this industry consolidation will mean to Zooks? Yeah, Jay, I think your take on this is the different perspective we need to keep. You know, the opportunity for autonomous vehicles hasn't changed at all. That stays as it was. So I go back actually to what was a debate for years. So what's the what's the path here? Should it be through ADAS and you know advanced driver assistance systems or ADS going full autonomy? And I remember always saying, like, both. And that's kind of where we are here. And just to point out kind of what you're emphasizing, you know, the automakers are focused on the here and now, which are the driver assist systems, which are on the road today. And to your point, if you take it from an economic perspective, if you're going to have the longer view for the automated systems, that's going to take partnerships with Alphabet, GM, which is large, Amazon, you know, and, and in particular tech companies that have these longer horizons, right, that can uh, afford the investment over time. And so, again, the opportunity hasn't changed. All the chances to save lives and, you know, reduce the carnage on our roads, all that is the same. I think to your point, we're just seeing the consolidation, which is probably actually be a good thing in the long run. Thanks, David. Um, I didn't work with the insurers during my tenure at Toyota when we were putting our test ABs on the road. And so I have a limited understanding of the role, the substantial role that insurers play in putting ABs on the road. Can you tell us something about your position on that? Sure. Sure, Jane. And you know, I'm sorry we missed you at Toyota, but you know, there's plenty of time to come and join the exciting insurance industry. <laughs> <laughs> I've always had that. <laughs> so it's a good question. I guess I'll offer a few different angles on that. Um, you know, when you think about insurance companies like Liberty, right, we're in the risk-taking business. And you know, safety is really about understanding risk, how to avoid it, how to mitigate it, and how to protect from it uh, if you can't avoid it or mitigate it, right? And so, you know, at Liberty, we've got a long history of building safety cultures with our clients and our communities. Uh, we've got a large risk control organization that uh, you know, has leaders in behavioral safety, mechanical safety, and integration of those things. And you know, as I think about this, like at, at Liberty, uh, you know, we're, we're a 110-year-old company, and in our, in our lobby, there's a, uh, on the wall, there's a creed that says, we help people live safer, more secure lives. And you know, we believe that progress happens when people feel secure. And so uh, just by partnering with Motional and um, Aurora, right, we help them get their vehicles on the road to test it and to iterate it on technology. And that presents risk to the public. And you know, by protecting from that risk, we allow these guys to you know, learn what they need to learn to bring that technology you know, to scale commercially and do it safely. Um, you know, I think on the technical side of safety as well, through our Liberty Mutual Strategic Ventures Group, we invest, we're actually an investor in forward thinking companies like Edgecase Research. Um, and Edgecase, you know, with, with their uh, experts in autonomous systems, right, they're helping to build, build roadmap, roadmaps around tracking um, safety measures. And over time, that helps understand the relativity of safety. Um, I'd add to that that, uh, you know, we, we think. Liberty that you know, we exist to help people embrace today and confidently pursue tomorrow, right? So when we think about the safety conversations about how confident can we all get in the technology and, and getting it to scale on the roads. And you know, one way to build confidence is to have standards. Um, 
And so, you know, we're pursuing a voting seat on the 4600 committee so that we can review and comment on that standard as it, as it evolves. Um, we have a public affairs group that engages at the state and federal level on you know, legislative and regulatory standards. Um, and then I think the last thing I would say is, uh, you know, public perception of AV safety is, is a key part of this, right? That, that acceptance and really comes down to understanding, you know, helping the broader public understand how safe it is on a relative basis. And to that end, we participate um, in, in PAVE, which is a coalition of industry and academia and, and other experts, and, and it's about you know, educating the public on the benefits of autonomous of vehicles and you know, how much they can benefit from that in the long run. Thanks, David. Um, David raised an important point around <coughs> standards. So the industry will make progress as it reaches agreement on critical safety standards, which take a very long time, a very long time, to develop and can't be developed too far in advance of the technology maturity. So that's a catch-22 for automated vehicles at this moment. But the leading tech and uh, automotive manufacturers created an interim harmonization platform for themselves called the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium. Um, Ryan was at the table when we first started. Chris's company are strong contributors and so this next question is to Chris. Um, what are some of the key accomplishments that the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium have agreed upon, the safety assurance agreements um, that will build towards the future of standards? Thanks for, for bringing this up to you in terms of standardization because uh, with the pace uh, of the development, the industry standard development organizations are coming together to, to move the big rocks. Um, and there were a number of comments uh, from our earlier sessions today that talked about that cooperation and collaboration that's necessary uh, from the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium as well as, as other groups that we participate in. You mentioned UL 4600 that led to the, um, the creation of the 4600 standard uh, that addresses safety cases, which ours is based on, uh, which you can find at aurora.tech uh, backslash blog if you want to learn more about it. Uh, for the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium, some of the big rocks that group um, has moved together are things like metrics, best practices on metrics, best practices on first responder interactions. We all need to solve that problem. It does us no good to solve it alone. Um, the VR use of vulnerable road users, we need to have some common terminology and taxonomy around how we describe them before we even get to the point where we can describe behaviors and interactions. So we have a, a best practice that addresses that. Um, the uh, fall, uh, fallback test driver, there is a best practice, I think it was the first one that ABSC published, uh, that addresses the training and qualifications for those drivers. Our vehicle operators are highly trained in how to supervise autonomy systems and are a critical part of our development. And the industry came together to, to put forth a standard on that. Uh, and then there are other uh, terminology and taxonomy standards around the operational design domain, the ODD, I think that a couple of folks have mentioned, um, data collection, uh, and um, a missing one, I believe. Big red button. Big red button. <laughs> yes, a mess. Yeah, oh gosh, my team is going to be very upset that I didn't hit that first. Um, the safety management system, there's an informational report on that that gives you the foundation elements, foundational elements for what any company needs to look to in order to set itself in the direction of creating and consistently improving an SMS, a safety management system. We borrow those practices mostly from aviation, so those were standardized first by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, but we've adapted them and uh, applied them to AV development and, and deployment. So it's not just about an operational context, but a de developmental context. And how you manage and monitor your safety culture needs to be active. You can't uh, manage what you can't measure. So measuring that, making sure you put deliberate practices around your safety culture, making sure you've got safety policy internally to set the standard for what you will achieve, and then safety risk management assurance practices on the back end to make sure that you design the right thing and are you executing it as you designed. Um, that's a constant process that needs de uh, dedicated care and feeding. You have to dedicate staff and teams to that. You need top-down commitment, which we have through our accountable executive, Chris Ermson, uh, who's our CEO. So and those kind of practices, I think, that ABC, ABSC is putting out are giving the industry a foundation to have these discussions, but it's just a start. 
Uh, and we continue to collaborate on those, those best practices. And, and forums like this, where we're having open discussion around what the big problems are, um, are critical. Um, that collaboration needs to continue. Thanks. Um, I want to ask a regulatory question of you, Bernard. I don't know if you can see me looking at you on the screen. Um, you know, standards, harmonization among industry, all lead into better informed regulatory decisions. What are you doing in California? What are you doing in California? What are you thinking about now as you see uh, vehicles in commercial operation in the cities in California and you're look at, looking ahead to more of those vehicles coming onto the road? Yeah, so, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, first, I want to address what you brought up earlier with regard to consolidation within the industry. Here in California, we've seen that over the past few years. I mean, prior to the pandemic, we've had close to 80 companies that were actively testing within California. And uh, over the, the last two years, we've seen a consolidation from those roughly 80 companies to now about, well, I would say about 45 or so that are, that are testing. You know, some companies have, have dissolved, some companies have been absorbed by others. So we've seen this sort of consolidation, which speaks to the, um, the item you brought earlier with regard to Ford and Argo. And I agree with Mark, Mark's absolutely right. It all depends upon the long-term goals and the short-term goals. Uh, you know, if it's going to be an ADS system and that makes more economic sense in the short term as opposed to a longer term ADS system, I think there can be room for both. I think you should, people or companies are, are migrating towards that. From a regulatory standpoint, um, the question about how safe is sitting enough is something that is always uh, something we strive to answer. But as a technical person, I struggle with that. What, what is that number? that we can look at and it doesn't exist and it still needs to be in place. Um, what we are doing now is we have a regulatory structure that allows companies to be able to test their vehicles on the roadways either with a safety driver or without a safety driver and then a regulatory structure for deployment of those vehicles in whatever business model a company would have. There are three companies currently uh, that are authorized to deploy their vehicles. Um, you know them very well. Uh, two of them are doing ride, want to do ride hailing services in dense urban areas. And, uh, and as they are doing so, we are seeing some of the issues that companies have with regard to scaling operations from you know, a few vehicles to many more vehicles that would make economic sense for the company. Uh, so, growing pains, uh, if you will, but one I think that is necessary that uh, we all need to go through as this technology is being brought to bear. Thanks, Bernard. I just want to say for the, for the people in the room, those three companies are Neuro, which is a package delivery company, Aurora, excuse me, not Aurora, Crew, not yet. Um, it for driver operations. Crew is in So, that's right. Perfect. Um, three of us, you may have heard in our introductions, have worked on both sides of this innovation, on the regulatory USDOT side and within tech companies. And I know for myself, I've spent a long time struggling with the challenge of getting the right people together around the right table to create the kind of roadmap that will lead us reliably to smart regulations. But first, the roadmap in terms of what needs to be solved by whom. Um, and, and I want to turn this question to Mark, because he outranked all of us as the administrator for the auto regulator. Have you been, you know, do you think the same thing about who needs to be at the table? You know, what do we need to be saying to each other to, you know, in moving in the same direction, you know, moving towards a goal where a, a kind of a fragmented group with a lot of good intentions and good relationships, but 
no clear, I would say, no clear direction. So inherent in your question is a critical element of the answer, which is you need all stakeholders at the table. And so even as administrator, you know, I've always pointed out, industry, don't wait for the government. You already pointed out, you know, when I was there, eight to 10 years for regulation to happen. And in the AV space, that was, you know, about eight years too slow, given how quickly all the technology was going on. Which isn't, it's not the excuse not to regulate, but it tells you you have to find different pathways to get to the safety goals that you're after. And so, specifically to your question, Jane, I would say, um, one of the challenges with the industry doing it on its own is it doesn't have the authority needed for enforcement, for example. And so, you know, the good companies are going to pursue, they're going to get together and pursue, it's the ones that you worry about on the edges, right, that uh, could be doing things that need folks to look after them that are going to help keep the community safe, for example. And so, you know, I think there's a clear role for the regulator, for NHTSA and DOT to be there. Um, they don't have to always be doing regulation. I think the AEB challenge that we did back in 2015, 2016 is a great example. But you need them at the table so people know, do this. If you don't want to do it, fine, we'll do the regulation. Um, I also think, just you know, to be very specific, you need the DOT NISA regulator group basically being explicit about here's the stuff we want to focus on. Not just regulation, NCAP. Is there a need for an NCAP? You know, new technology assessment program. Um, a parallel that would go after some of this kind of thing, for example. Um, at the same time, I think you need a combined group, all stakeholders, that are going to basically identify what do we need to work on. You know, what are the priorities? ABSC has stepped into some of those. Where are the gaps that need to be done? And I would say besides identifying those issues, maybe not that group, but another group needs to confront what I consider the biggest challenges, and that's the execution. You know, I think the technology is going to get figured out. It's the deployment of these systems, whether it's ADAS or ABS, in cities where the rubber meets the road, where the challenges are. If they're all electric, will the grid support it? Um, pick up and drop off the curbs. Does the city even know what curb space they have, etc.? There's so many execution deployment issues that I think, again, you need the regulator involved, you know, to help make sure everybody knows we're going to do this. You need the industry and all stakeholders kind of identifying what we need to focus on, what's the roadmap you describe, and you need another group probably very tactical about how do we execute to get the full benefit, you know, the capitalize really fully on the optimal opportunities we keep talking about. Thanks, Mark. I, I would argue that we also need the highway community at the table to ensure safe integration of driving you know, within the existing fleet. Brian, uh, Chris, do you want to add to what Mark has said? Sure. Um, I mean, I always think of this as collaboration. The word that always comes to mind is collaboration, right? I mean, this is, from a technology perspective, we've got ABSC industries working really uh, well and developing the best practices that they can share with NHTSA. So, you know, collaborating with the regulators. Um, you know, we operate Uber Eats, with Uber Eats in Santa Monica. We, we do uh, uh, ride hailing in, in Las Vegas on a, on a lift uh, platform, and we just announced a, um, a collaboration with Uber um, for a 10-year ride hailing um, opportunity. You know, but we do a lot of work not only with our partners, but with you know the agencies within uh, Las Vegas. So I think it is bringing all the, the stakeholders to the table, right? Because this is not just a simple problem. It's not just you know a technology issue. It's the human factors. It's the regulatory piece. And, you know, NHTSA, you know, I went through many regulations, and as Mark said, you know, it can be eight to 10 years, right? It is very difficult and it is long, but there's things that industry can do to help, uh, you know, kind of NHTSA gain some experience. So I think it really is about uh, collaboration, which I think we've all, you know, kind of have that, that same mentality that, uh, you know, we're all working towards improving the, the transportation system from a safety, mobility, and efficiency perspective, and we all have to work together to, to meet that goal. We're gonna sound like a broken record, keep echoing each other, but it's because this stuff works. Uh, the, the collaboration is key, and we've published a safety playbook that we operate under, and part of that playbook is transparency and collaboration. We have uh, worked at an express goal to be incredibly transparent. We've, we've published quite a bit on aurora.tech backslash blog. Uh, but there you'll find our safety case, and that's where you get to see how we're assuring ourselves, first, that we have thought of everything. 
right? That, that's kind of the tenet behind the UL 4600 standard is did you think of this? Uh, and in that safety case, which is a structured argument supported by evidence uh, to your top level claim, our top level claim is that our vehicles are acceptably safe to operate on public roads. And then that claim is broken down into principles. Um, the five principles are proficient, fail safe, continuously improving, uh, trustworthy, and resilient. In that trustworthy, that's where you'll find the kinds of things that make the company stronger, that give you that transparency, that, that tell us that we are going to be collaborating with stakeholders, communicating constantly. We, we collaborate with both the federal and state uh, officials where we operate to understand our technology and understand what our deployment uh, model and plans are. We've published our roadmap. You can find that uh, in the public domain. So we have tried to make sure that everyone understands uh, what we're doing and that we're able to collaborate where possible, but we're also able to educate along the way. So I think both of those are critical to making sure that everyone understands where this is going and can learn to trust as, as we develop and deploy. Yeah, that's a perfect lead-in to uh, the closing part of our discussion. The, uh, the USDOT is committed to zero road fatalities going forward, which is a very high bar. And as we started today with our little quiz question, 42,000 deaths on the highway is huge. And yet, if you break it down into deaths per miles traveled, that's one death for something above 100 million miles. When you look at the fatal or near fatal crashes for a sober, experienced, alert driver, that's above one of those every 100,000. So how do we, let's start with Mark again, what benchmarks will Zeus use to demonstrate that its automated vehicles can exceed safe driving capability of a good driver. So I'm, I'm not going to speak for Zeus. I'm not there anymore, which yeah. actually is great, because then I can you know, point to everybody. Um, and, and, and I think you're bringing up something really critical. And, and when I was at NHTSA, so I made sure everybody knew the exact number. So for you know, 2021, it was 42,950. Every one of those is a person. And I always, I get the argument. Yeah, but it's a big vehicle mile travel. It's like, you shouldn't lose your life going to school, going to work, going to the store, crossing the street. Um, when you look at the things that are actually taking these lives away and seriously injuring people, that shouldn't happen. Um, and so that's why I think morally, ethically, and frankly, aspirationally, zero's got to be the number. Um, and I think what you're raising is every company has to figure out what are the specifics? What's the safety case? What are the metrics? You know, what are the internal things, redundancy, no single point of failure? What are the specific elements that are going to organize to get them there? And so I think to, you know, part of what you're talking about here at the panel is it's really critical to have the transparency that several folks have already talked about. People need to put what their targets, what their objectives are, and even more important, how they're doing reaching them. Because I'll just finish this part by just saying, um, you know, I, I think this is the hard part. Everyone loves to ask, how safe is safe enough? We have not answered that question for the current road safety program, right? 42,915, well, that's not safe enough, okay? And so I think what's kind of interesting is we have not actually, and you know, at DOT, everybody knows this, so what's the definition you use? Well, an unreasonable risk to safety, and then we don't define that. And so we keep asking this question, but just to be clear, as Bernard was saying, like, we all struggle with how to answer this. It'd be great if there had been an answer, and we could just apply it to AVs. We don't have that. And frankly, it's unrealistic to think, oh, we have a new technology, so that's how we can answer that question. Much harder. So I one final thing here. I really believe in innovation. Then we have to use data, so we can have data-driven best practices. That will lead to the foundation of whatever regulation will help us build the safest, best system that will move us around, uh, but at the same time protect people. Thanks, Mark. It makes me think that the next question should go to David in the insurance industry to ask whether you've begun to grapple with what are the benchmarks that you'll use to measure how safe is safe enough when the time comes to write policies for these systems. 
Well, that's, that's a great question, and, and we're actually writing policies for some of these people already today. Um, and, you know, in, in some respects, it's a question of relativity, right? In the insurance business, it's not, we, we expect there to be loss. That's why we exist, right? To you know, protect from that. So, you know, we have a lot of data on, you know, how human drivers uh, behave and, and what that looks like. And, um, so for us, the relativity question becomes, you know, how, how much safer is it going to be and how will that translate into you know, the, the economic cost of the premiums that we need to charge uh, to the customers to, to cover that loss and, and make our products available. So, uh, you know, we, we try to work with our partners, and I think one of the things we were talking about at our table earlier was you know, how can we share data together so that, um, you know, we can, we can decide on those benchmarks and we can, you know, put our heads together and say, what is it, what is the right because I don't think it exists yet. Um, and, and I think the, the avenues that we have for data exchange and, and you know, people being concerned about you know, protecting their own data versus you know, the greater good, I think we need to work through some of those things to, to create the benchmarks. Chris, Brian, do you want to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know, we, we talk about understanding transparent <coughs> and, and what we're trying to achieve. We, we, we also still have our eye on the prize of the benefits. The, the benefits from this technology, you know, when you, when you talked about some of the um, data you just mentioned, uh, when you look at the fatalities, you look at the crashes, uh, you know, the award driver will not be tired, distracted, drunk. Um, but there are still a lot of opportunities for us to understand their safety challenges and how to deploy. Uh, we're doing this rather iteratively, so there's, there's a careful consideration of how we learn. So the way that our award our driver is architected yeah, it's, it's more difficult, but we architected this to be transferable across the platforms. So even though we're starting with a freight model where we're doing highway driving with a truck terminal to terminal, that truck would then be expanded in terms of capabilities. The Aurora driver would be able to go from terminals to depots, depots to warehouses, warehouses to stores. That then, of course, transfers into similar routes for ride hailing. So when you think of going to the airport, you're going to be on a highway. So airport to highway, highway to hotel, hotel to city centers. That iterative learning allows us to thoughtfully expand the ODD, the operational dri uh, driving domain, um, operational design domain, my apologies, uh, in a way that we are able to transfer the learnings. Um, this allows us to do this in, in iterative pieces. And once we have one problem, we solve that problem, then we solve another problem. Instead of trying to, to, to bite off the entire apple, we do this in pieces thoughtfully and we're communicating those. Uh, so to Mark's point, communicate where you are on that mode roadmap. We've communicated our roadmap. We, we are constantly publishing where we are. And I think that transparency will help the dialogue around what is being achieved, what is possible, and what's planned. It is the broken record um, analogy here, but I mean, it is, you know, it is about communicating. Um, and if it was simply, you know, a metric on, you know, crash rate, it would be easier, um, but it's not just that, right? There's a lot of context that needs to go into that. So I think it's about the safety culture, uh, different metrics. And I do think that's where industry, the regulators, um, you know, communicating, uh, and getting you know um, information out to the public so that uh, everybody's kind of on board and understands what does that um, transition look like. Uh, but it is about communication. It's not a simple you know single metric, right? There's many different aspects that go into that, and the collaboration with industry and the government is going to help us get there. Um, and and to, to add a highway perspective to this. If you put a fleet of self-driving vehicles that can't themselves crash, can't run into you on the left or the right, can't rear-end you, and can take evasive maneuvers when they see a vehicle closing in to rear-end them, if you put a fleet of those distributed in the existing driving fleet on our highways, they're not just safer as a single vehicle compared to a human driver, potentially. They create safety for the whole fleet. And let's reflect on our newest learning from the pandemic, herd immunity. If you put safety vaccinated vehicles into the fleet, the whole fleet gains safety protection from them. At what point are those vehicles that we're now developing, at what point are they safe enough to begin transferring safety broadly among us all. Thank you for listening to us. We're gonna join you at the table. 
Thank you to our panelists, to Bernard and Mark in California. It was great seeing you. Back to John. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're so sorry you couldn't join us, but uh, enjoy the rest of your day in California. We have a little bit of a change in program, slight change here. So you may have noticed uh, we have what we're called what are called research tapas that are happening over lunch, and this is to introduce a little bit of the the work that the MIT Mobility Initiative is doing through some of the faculty and researchers here at MIT. Uh, I'm going to actually take a moment to introduce uh, Professor Kathy Wu. Kathy is uh, on the faculty in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, here at MIT. And actually, you know, Jane, your closing comment about, what was it? Uh, vaccinated. Safety vaccinated vehicles, <laughs> right. which actually Kathy's doing quite a bit of work on that sort of concept of mixed fleets, right? So what happens when you have some of the vehicles autonomous and or some traditionally driven vehicles? Uh, but in particular, uh, Kath has been working on an MMI project that we call Safety as a Performance Venture. So uh, this will take about uh, eight to 10 minutes. So we're gonna do this, what was supposed to be over lunch, we're gonna do this now. And then we're gonna go immediately into the round table discussions. So, Kathy. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, John. Uh, and sorry to have cut into your break. This actually segues perfectly given the topic of this panel. So, uh, and actually, several, uh, my talk follows really well several of the comments. I think I'll point out Mark Ristein's comment about um, a sort of trying to define a level of safety for roadways generally being um, sort of foundational for defining roadway safety for autonomous vehicles. So where we are is um, at that foundational piece. How do we define this more generally? How do we um, sort of go back to first principles um, to take a look at this question? So I'm gonna be talking about um, this project, which is trying to look at roadway safety as a performance measure. And let me give you a bit of perspective on where I come from uh, for this project. Okay. So um, we've seen the, we've um, heard this number maybe like five times, ten times already today. There's 43,000 fatalities uh, in the U.S. over the last year. Um, this translates, um, as was mentioned, to about 80 million miles uh, driven per fatality. This is a very significant benchmark, very arduous task, uh, and a very important one. So. Let me actually uh, provide a, um, a perspective from sort of more where I come from. So when it comes to autonomous vehicles, we care about multiple dimensions. We care about performance and we care about safety. And it's not necessarily um, that, it's not necessarily a trade-off, actually we don't know it right now, but we know we don't want to launch without a sufficient level of safety. Um, but where we are now is we actually don't know what, where safety should be, how safe is safe enough. So I'm sort of reiterating the, the last panel. Um, but one way that we're gonna put forward to defining safety is relative to um, some baseline, uh, relative to human driving. And it turns out that even though we have this number of 80 million miles per uh, fatality, what we don't have is how does an individual change in behavior translate to this number? How does changing how one accelerates or decelerates, how does changing how one does routing at this very low level of change, at something that someone can define at the engineering level, how does this actually translate into a number such as 43,000 fatalities over the course of a year? This is a huge, uh, there's a huge sort of difference in the order of magnitude of concepts that we're talking about. Sort of like moving one meter to 80 million miles. So uh, something we actually have to define for ourselves is actually where is human driving on this uh, sort of space of performance and safety, okay? We don't really know but then relative to that, we can define where do we want autonomous vehicles to be. 
right now, without a clear definition of where human drivers are, really mapped to the level of engineering, uh, my sense is that from an industry perspective, from a technology standpoint, development standpoint, we have to be very cautious because we don't want to be less safe than humans, but we don't know where that is. So we have to design our technology to be very cautious okay, and try to not cross that line. And that presumably does come at a cost of performance. Okay. So these are all hypotheticals. We don't know where any of these actually inform where some of these points are. So we can define a point at which uh, AVs should be relative to human driving. Um, by doing so, we hope to translate safety into uh, a performance measure. Most of my group, uh, I will just say I'm new to thinking about safety, most of my group thinks about other performance measures of autonomous vehicles. Uh, congestion, travel time, emissions, uh, fuel consumption, that kind of thing. We're trying to take a data-driven approach to transform safety into yet another performance measure so that we can actually analyze the trade-off or the joint optimization of the uh, of multiple multiple objectives. So you know it's not clear where these curves will be, um, but presumably, hopefully, presumably, uh, sort of better when we're, than where we are now. So let me tell let me give you sort of the key idea as to how we plan to do this translation. And for those of you who are around, uh, there will be a longer version of this talk same time tomorrow. Um, so. If you think about um, the x-axis here, safety, we can think of this as uh, different levels of safety or different levels of responsibility. So um, we might have some sort of standard for how, what types of driving situations a human driver should be responsible for or an AV should be responsible for. And we would like to have some mapping between this, those sets of scenarios to uh, this 43,000 uh, fatalities or some other number of fatalities. So the key idea is to try to define this mapping between responsibility levels and actual driving scenarios. So let me give you an example of a driving scenario, a longitudinal car following, a vehicle following another roadway user. Okay, so the question that we're, we're attempting to answer here is, what are the driving scenarios that actually translate to 43,000 fatalities? This may or may not be the standard that we wish to set for uh, autonomous vehicles, but this is the standard for which we have data from human driving. From this, we can then define relative measures to this. Do we want autonomous vehicles to achieve half as many fatalities? Then we can ask the question of, of what's the transition? Um, so the, this, this 43,000 fatalities will translate to some subset of driving scenarios for which we presume human drivers can you know, safely uh, mitigate accidents, uh, crashes. So then if we want the safety level to be, you know, uh, to achieve half as many fatalities, this will presumably translate into another larger set of scenarios for which the technology-enabled uh, vehicles can achieve uh, uh, responsible driving. Okay, so to provide a numerical example, these are all made-up numbers, uh, we might think that the human driver uh, can mitigate accidents uh, you know, beyond uh, some kind of following distance from the leading vehicle, and, uh, and perhaps with automated uh, vehicle technology, we see some some sort of uh, more relaxed um, uh, range. So this project is really about how does one do this transition? And the approach that we take is to use large-scale traffic data to actually reconstruct traffic and actually define um, and characterize these driving scenarios. The overall approach has two pieces. One is this traffic reconstruction uh, phase. This gives us sort of the total number of encounters of a, one of these uh, risky uh, driving scenarios. Um, other data can be used to reconstruct crashes. So how many crashes actually occurred? Okay. Think of this human drivers, highways, specific scenario. The risk 
level of certain maneuvers can be thought of as this ratio between the actual crashes that occurred and the actual number of encounters. We fairly carefully log the crashes. We don't fairly carefully log the encounters. So this project has to do with estimating the encounters. There is some manipulation that we have to do on the crash side as well to uh, reconstruct the aspects of the crash that were not recorded. Um, this is all for a specific crash type, severity level, time period, um, region, um, wherever the data is sourced from. So, so far in this project, um, which we've been working on for the last few months, uh, we have focused uh, first on the traffic reconstruction stage. So, uh, this involves selecting, reconciling data sources, uh, selecting a site. We've uh, decided to start with California interstates. Um, this is a region in which uh, the data is fairly high quality and available. Um, so we're simulating here uh, uh, interstates uh, crossing four counties in California where we have both crash data as well as traffic flow data. Um, uh, we have done some statistical checking to see that uh, crashes on California interstates are statistically representative of interstates nationally. Um, and this is now one of the largest, uh, what are called traffic microsimulators, uh, microsimulations uh, now done, which is uh, we've simulated um, about uh, 600,000 miles uh, on, at any given time, there are around 30,000 cars at a time. But if you look carefully, this is actually only for 15 minutes of traffic, so you can imagine what it will take to simulate uh, you know, a, a week, a month, a year, uh, multiple years of data. So um, just to provide a bit of what, where we're going, these are purely illustrative because these outputs are based on 15 minutes of simulation. There's a lot of computational work that needs to be done to scale this effort. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a sense of uh, how risky is our different driving maneuvers. And here what we have is a breakdown of, on the left side and on the right side are just different, uh, different speeds of driving. Okay, sorry, uh, sorry. Different, yeah, different speeds of roadway traffic. And what is plotted is the probability of a crash for different kinds of scenarios, whether it is the leading vehicle decelerating or if it's a lane change. And what we can see uh, just qualitatively is that at higher speeds as compared to lower speeds, the lane change risk as compared to, uh, sorry, uh, lane change uh, crash risk relative to a uh, rear end uh, from decelerating uh, sort of switches, the order switches. So uh, at higher speeds, lane changes are uh, more risky, lower, at lower speeds, uh, rear ending is, uh, is riskier. But anyway, these are purely illustrative. I wouldn't, take, I wouldn't take any conclusions from this. This is more a hint as to where we're headed in terms of the metrics that we're hoping to generate from large scale as, uh, versions of this. So um, tomorrow we're gonna give a more detailed version of this discussion. So it'll include a deeper dive into the policy framework, um, into the traffic reconstruction, the um, crash reconstruction stages, as well as the final risk estimation. Um, we'll also take a deeper dive into the data sources, the perfect uh, challenges and risk, risks, as well as the uh, project timelines. So finally, I'll, I want to mention the team. I was sitting in the back, uh, so if any of you have questions when I run off to meetings, uh, I'll be here to field more questions. And we had a lovely intern who helped us uh, get started with this project over the summer. Awesome, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Now we're going to go directly into the roundtable discussions. So we have a number of table discussion leaders. I'm going to ask the table discussion leaders to kind of self-organize among the tables. Um, we're going to, let's go for about uh, 25 minutes, all right, to follow up to the autonomous vehicle panel that, that we just heard. Let's break it well. Yeah. Yeah. Actually inform where some of these points are, so we can define a point at which uh, AVs should be relative to human driving. Um, by doing so, we hope to translate safety into uh, a performance measure. Most of my group 
uh, I will just say I'm new to thinking about safety. Most of my group thinks about other performance measures of autonomous vehicles. Uh, congestion, travel time, emissions, uh, fuel consumption, that kind of thing. We're trying to take a data-driven approach to transform safety into yet another performance measure so that we can actually analyze the trade-off or the joint optimization of the uh, of multiple multiple objectives. So you know it's not clear where these curves will be, um, but presumably, hopefully, presumably, uh, sort of better when we're, than where we are now. So let me tell, let me give you sort of the key idea as to how we plan to do this translation. And for those of you who are around, uh, there will be a longer version of this talk, same time tomorrow. Um, so. If you think about um, the x-axis here, safety, we can think of this as uh, different levels of safety or different levels of responsibility. So um, we might have some sort of standard for how, what types of driving situations a human driver should be responsible for or an AV should be responsible for. And we would like to have some mapping between this, those sets of scenarios to uh, this 43,000 uh, fatalities or some other number of fatalities. So the key idea is to try to define this mapping between responsibility levels and actual driving scenarios. So let me give you an example of a driving scenario, a longitudinal car following, a vehicle following another roadway user. Okay, so the question that we're, we're attempting to answer here is, what are the driving scenarios that actually translate to 43,000 fatalities? This may or may not be the standard that we wish to set for uh, autonomous vehicles, but this is the standard for which we have data from human driving. From this, we can then define relative measures to this. Do we want autonomous vehicles to achieve half as many fatalities? Then we can ask the question of, of transition, um, so the, this, this 43,000 fatalities will translate to some subset of driving scenarios for which we presume human drivers can you know, safely uh, mitigate accidents, uh, crashes. So then if we want the safety level to be, you know, uh, to achieve half as many fatalities, this will presumably translate into another larger set of scenarios for which the technology-enabled uh, vehicles can achieve uh, uh, responsible driving. Okay, so to provide a numerical example, these are all made-up numbers, uh, we might think that the human driver uh, can mitigate accidents uh, you know, beyond uh, some kind of following distance from the leading vehicle, and, uh, and perhaps with automated uh, vehicle technology, we see some some sort of uh, more relaxed um, uh, range. So this project is really about how does one do this transition? And the approach that we take is to use large-scale traffic data to actually reconstruct traffic and actually define um, and characterize these driving scenarios. The overall approach has two pieces. One is this traffic reconstruction uh, phase. This gives us sort of the total number of encounters of a, one of these uh, risky uh, driving scenarios. Um, other data can be used to reconstruct crashes. So how many crashes actually occurred? Okay. Think of this human drivers, highways, specific scenario. The risk level of certain maneuvers can be thought of as this ratio between the actual crashes that occurred and the actual number of encounters. We fairly carefully log the crashes. We don't fairly carefully log the encounters. So this project has to do with estimating the encounters. There is some manipulation that we have to do on the crash side as well to uh, reconstruct the aspects of the crash that were not recorded. Um, this is all for a specific crash type, severity level, time period, um, region. Um, wherever the data is sourced from. So, so far in this project, um, which we've been working on for the last few months, uh, we have focused uh, first on the traffic reconstruction stage. So uh, this involves selecting, reconciling data sources, 
uh, selecting a site, we've uh, decided to start with California interstates. Um, this is a region in which uh, the data is fairly high quality and available. Um, so we're simulating here uh, uh, interstates uh, crossing four counties in California where we have both crash data as well as traffic flow data. Um, uh, we have done some statistical checking to see that uh, crashes on California interstates are statistically representative of interstates nationally. Um, and this is now one of the largest uh, what are called traffic micro simulators, uh, micro simulations uh, now done, which is uh, we've simulated um, about uh, 600,000 miles uh, on, at any given time, there are around 30,000 cars at a time. But if you look carefully, this is actually only for 15 minutes of traffic, so you can imagine what it will take to simulate uh, you know, a, a week, a month, a year, uh, multiple years of data. So um, just to provide a bit of what, where we're going, these are purely illustrative because these outputs are based on 15 minutes of simulation. There's a lot of computational work that needs to be done to scale this effort. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a sense of uh, how risky is our different driving maneuvers. And here what we have is a breakdown of, on the left side and on the right side are just different, uh, different speeds of driving. Okay, sorry, uh, sorry. Different, yeah, different speeds of roadway traffic. And what is plotted is the probability of a crash for different kinds of scenarios, whether it is the leading vehicle decelerating or if it's a lane change. And what we can see uh, just qualitatively is that at higher speeds as compared to lower speeds, the lane change risk as compared to, uh, sorry, uh, lane change uh, crash risk relative to a uh, rear end uh, from decelerating uh, sort of switches, the order switches. So uh, at higher speeds, lane changes are uh, more risky, lower, at lower speeds, uh, rear ending is, uh, is riskier. But anyway, these are purely illustrative. I wouldn't, take, I wouldn't take any conclusions from this. This is more a hint as to where we're headed in terms of the metrics that we're hoping to generate from large scale as, uh, versions of this. So um, tomorrow we're gonna give a more detailed version of this discussion. So it'll include a deeper dive into the policy framework, um, into the traffic reconstruction, the um, crash reconstruction stages, as well as the final risk estimation. Um, we'll also take a deeper dive into the data sources, the perfect uh, challenges and risk, risks, as well as the uh, project timelines. So finally, I'll, I want to mention the team. I was sitting in the back, uh, so if any of you have questions when I run off to meetings, uh, I'll be here to field more questions. And we had a lovely intern who helped us uh, get started with this project over the summer. Awesome, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Now we're going to go directly into the roundtable discussions. So we have a number of table discussion leaders. I'm going to ask the table discussion leaders to kind of self-organize among the tables. Um, we're going to, let's go for about uh, 25 minutes, all right, to follow up to the autonomous vehicle panel that, that we just heard. Let's break it well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Um, so this is uh, some very short uh, feedback on uh, research we've been doing into the uh, reliability or unreliability of public EV charging in the US, which you may well have seen uh, in the news. Uh, it's surprisingly hard to get data on this topic, but today, one in four attempts to fast charge an EV at a, at a non-Tesla charging station in the US will be unsuccessful. Right? There's a few caveats around that, right? So I'm primarily focused on the US, although Adrian and a few other people have told me that the UK and Europe um, have the same problems. Um, and we can talk a little about why Tesla is doing a somewhat better job than the, than the open ecosystem. Um, but the reality is that while 
Charging networks like EVgo and Electric by America like to tell us that they have 95 to 98% uptime. The lived experience of EV drivers in the US is dramatically worse than that. And so that's the topic we've been going after. Um, you know, what does it mean for a charger to not work? Well, it could be any of these things, right? It could be that the, the hardware itself is broken, or the plug's been driven over, or the station's been vandalized, the cord's been cut to steal the copper. Right? These, these things are real and unavoidable of, of some piece of infrastructure that's living in the public space. Um, but many more of the problems that we're seeing are actually more like the two on the right-hand side which is a, a digital problem relating to connectivity, to user authentication, to payments, um, and all of these things. We know the physics of how you get electricity from the grid to the car is very straightforward. We know how to do that. It's all the other stuff that we're layering on the top to, to get a, a car that we don't know about, potentially a driver with an app and a credit card, and to make all those things work. So, you know, the, the next question that Ken goes after, well, you know, how much reliability are we getting? And, and yes, these things have broken quite a lot. The next logical question is, well, why are people not fixing these broken charges? Um, and so more of our effort has been to keep scratching the surface. Um, and one of them, we think, relates to the unit economics of charging. So. Um, I'm not picking on Electrify America, it's just that they are forced to publish more statistics than other companies. <clears throat> this is a snapshot out of their quarter two um, reporting to the California Energy Commission. If you look over on the right hand side for the utilization rates of these, these charges, so fraction of the data that the charges are used, you'll see numbers ranging from about 2% up to, in the upper limits, 14 to 16%. So, utilization of these stations is really low, and that's a different way of saying that the unit economics of these stations are really bad. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to build, you potentially expose it to demand charges, and you get paid back in cents per kilowatt hour of electricity delivered. So, part of what we've heard is about this gold rush um, the land grab to grab both sites and also incentives that have been offered by government agencies and utilities. The money's there to get the stations built up front, um, but the money's not there to do maintenance to keep those stations working after they've been, been put in the ground. Um, said differently, right, it's not even worth doing the maintenance because the amount of money you're going to make on, on keeping this thing alive is, is so marginal. Um, now, part two of, of our explanation for, for what's going on here is just the incredibly complex uh, digital ecosystem that these charges operate in. This is a, a map I stole out of a DOE report, right? but this is an Android-like open ecosystem where you have an EV charger speaking to an electric vehicle, it's connecting to some sort of uh, cellular connectivity, there's a payments processor, there's a, um, you know, a bank, there's a smartphone application. And whilst we have standards for how all these things are meant to operate, we, we exist in a world where the charging technologies are changing all the time, so newer and faster chargers are coming out, vehicles are changing all the time, so new EVs, over-the-air updates, you know, changing implementations of their software, and it just seems that we're doing a pretty crummy job of making everything talk to each other, right? And the, the potential for uh, errors in the, all these handshakes uh, are um, manifest. So we heard <clears throat> two theories about why this problem might resolve itself. The first one was sort of the Apple Maps theory of, of self-healing. Right, which today, you know, today, well, 10 years ago, Apple Maps would tell you that you could drive from, you know, Sausalito to downtown San Francisco, um, and maybe on the car ferry that doesn't exist, right? But that got better. We kept using it, and we pumped more data in, and the algorithms got better, and it'll just sort itself out. Um, 
you know, with, with Jim and I are pretty unsatisfied with this explanation, right? Partly because this is an enabling infrastructure, right? If we want to get people to buy electric vehicles, they've got to have a good experience, right? And both perceive that experience, but also the functional utility of, of, um, of charging at this infrastructure. The second, uh, you know, remedy that we've heard about is metrics. Right? So another explanation has been that, yeah, yeah, we know that we don't have a shared definition of what utilization is, but we'll give them a shared definition, right? So we came out at the start of this year with a thing called Nevi, we're gonna hand out a bunch of money to uh, build fast charging on our corridors, and as part of that, we're gonna have a shared definition of performance. And if you want the money, you've gotta deliver 97% uh, uptime Right, according to a shared and agreed upon formula. 97%, um, by the way, is not that great. That's 11 days of downtime per year. Um, so if, it's, if you're there with your flat EV on one of those 11 days, you, you're out of luck. Um, but even then, um, there's no explanation provided about what happens if you don't meet the standard, what remedy is there, um, and ultimately, all of this comes back to the fact that there's no system engineer here, right? It's, a, it's an open ecosystem, but no one's in charge. Um, so, we've come to the conclusion, you know, we are systems people, right? But a deliberate improvement effort is needed. Right? And where our thinking is going around, around this is that um, in the absence of everyone coming together to figure out how to solve these problems, um, we are hopeful that we can convene at least some, some number of these stakeholders together to try and work at um, the continuous improvement we need to make the system better. Uh, Dan Roos and Jim Womack have been through this 40 years ago with the IMVP, the International Motor Vehicle Program, MIT. Um, that's how we learned about lean and the Toyota production system and these types of initiatives in the first place. Um, so our hope is to go and apply some of this thinking to making EV charging better so that we can sell more EVs. So that's where we're going. All right, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Okay, so uh, next up uh, on our research Papa's menu, and this will be the last, the last one, is Dajang Su. Uh, da Jung is a research uh, assistant in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, working under the guidance of uh, Sanjay Sarma, who was with us uh, on the infrastructure panel uh, earlier this morning. Um, he's uh, worked with Ford in the past, uh, and he's done quite a lot of work on looking at the security of connected vehicles. Um, and so that's one of the things we're going to talk about today is um, thinking about how to make connected mobility systems uh, actually to enhance security and unlock value uh, in that process. Thanks for John's introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dajan So. I'm a research scientist at MIT Otherwise Lab. I work with Professor Sanjay Sarmar, uh, who was in the infrastructure panel this morning on connected vehicle cybersecurity. Uh, today, glad to be here to present our research on uh, the adoption of practice sensing on, on connected corridors. Uh, also, uh, we have a team member, Ben, uh, Al, uh, and uh, Jason. Uh, so let's get started. So what is clock sensing? So clock sensing is essentially another way to build a redundancy into transportation system uh, based on the technology V2X, um, vehicle to everything communication, which many of you are aware of. Um, essentially, the idea is to, rather than relying on sensing information from single entity, we can rely on sensing information from multiple entities, so we can have a first view of what's going on, say, near intersection. 
So why we are talking about collective sensing in the context of connected corridors? Uh, because we have a lot of issues, uh, like efficiency issues, uh, safety issues. Um, according to a recent study, um, the average signal costs more than uh, the average signal uh, delay is caused by the traffic light more than 80 hours per day in October 2020. You, you can think of the energy loss, the efficient loss, because we uh, we don't have a good uh, traffic light controller. And uh, regarding safety, I think uh, in today's infrastructure panel there are some statistics that brought up about how dangerous that intersection is. Um, one over five car incidents actually involve a left turn near the intersection. So uh, to make things more complicated, uh, the issue of efficiency and the safety when it comes to collective sensing issues also related to cybersecurity. So what we are doing here is to say, uh, can we tackle these three problems simultaneously in the early concept design stage of cyber sensing? So that's what we've been doing. So let's talk about so let's talk about each of them. So first of all, let's look at our efficiency. As I said, we want to have a smart traffic light control controller. Um, so rather than have the vehicle wait for the traffic light, wait for the green. Um, what, what if we can have a vehicle asking for green? So uh, we don't have the, uh, when we accumulate the queue near the intersection, then the traffic light can adjust its uh, timing phase in real time and turn to green if they realize there is a queue near uh, the intersections. So that's a one way, a, a one way of uh, applying cloud sensing to a uh, connected corridor. But as I mentioned, there are also cybersecurity issues. Uh, uh, because of the vulnerability in the supply chain of uh, B2X module, which I don't have time diving into today, uh, it's very likely you will have a, a guy sit on the road product and try to tell the vehicle there are many fake uh, cars, like the blue bonnet box you can see here near the intersection. So if you can think about that's actually the one way to have a full traffic line. The same thing that happened to uh, other communication, like a vehicle talking to a vehicle. So uh, what I would argue is that the issue, of, if you don't solve the uh, issue of cybersecurity, your safety and the efficiency benefits of cloud sensing can also be compromised. Uh, similarly, for safety, uh, we mentioned about the left turn risk when it, com when it comes to connected vehicles. Uh, think about if you have a, a vehicle trying to make a left turn, but because of there is an oversized car in front of the echo car, then this uh, this guy basically cannot see the car running to running in the uh, opposite direction. So think about if you if we can put an infrastructure sensor, say like a lidar, at the corner of the intersection, and capture what's going on in this intersection, we can actually share that information to the left turn vehicle. Uh, such that we can prevent that uh, left, -turn, uh, collision, uh, left turn collision. So uh, here are a couple of funding findings uh, after a couple of months work. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, about the first is that the first finding is about cybersecurity. We found like a relying rather than relying on single channel, single modality sensing approach, multi-channel sensing approach actually improves cybersecurity. Uh, second is uh, we found there is a lack of methodology and tool for designing and evaluate, in particular, infrastructure assisted life sensing. And the third is the standardization opportunity. So let's go uh, through that. So first of all, as I mentioned, uh, rather than relying on single uh, channel uh, authentication, uh, we found like a multi-factor, multi-channel authentication uh, would be very effective. Um, nowadays, uh, researchers in the, in the world of B2X, they're working on the idea of misbehavior detection. The idea is that when you receive a signal, uh, receive a signal message from cars, you authenticate it, uh, looking at whether the car has a right certificate or whether the message has the right uh, or physical content. But what we found is that there's uh, uh, researchers, including myself, have been uh, you know, working on this area for some time, but. Uh, what we found is that when it comes to connected corridor, you can actually merge the visual confirmation 
um, through the computer vision channel with the R authentication, which will be very effective. Uh, let me give you a, there is a good analogy I like, uh, I, I like a lot. So think about uh, I'm, uh, I'm coming here today to meet uh, someone uh, who I, I don't know before. Uh, so I'm probably going to, because I cannot recognize him or her, so I'm probably going to make a phone call, right? Then even if I make a phone call uh, in this room, maybe I still cannot confirm who, who I'm talking with because I basically don't know how, how does he really look, she looks like, right? So maybe I ask him through the phone channel and say, hey, could you wave your hands? That at that right moment, when a person wave the hands, I visually confirm that he or she is the person I'm talking to, right? If you think about the analog, the analog or the, the there's an analog between the example I just gave and the, the example of a roadside attacker, right? Because it's almost impossible at that right moment there will be another guy who also put the phone then with the hand, his or her hand, right? So this is our first uh, initial finding. Uh, we found it's a very interesting approach uh, in the domain of v 2 cybersecurity because no one had done this before. So uh, we, we have some plan to sort of expanding this into uh, experiment, some, run some experiments to validate this approach. So let's talk about second challenge, which is how do you design and evaluate collective sensing uh, at an early stage? Uh, so think about if you are a civil engineer, you want to put a sensor, like a LiDAR, near the corner of an intersection. How do you do that? First approach, I call it simulation-based. Essentially, what it says is that you run in, you put all these things into simulation, you run it, you got some data. But the problem is that are those results, uh, uh, you can, can you trust the results, are those scenarios, traffic scenarios representable, right? And another approach is a real-world deployment. Basically, what you can do is you buy a LiDAR from a supplier, say, below them. Um, then you refer to the menu saying, uh, if you look at the menu, they will tell, okay, just put a, install a LiDAR uh, on the phone, right? But is that the optimal or maybe reasonable uh, sensor placement? So what we're doing here is to find a way to sort of bridge the gap between real world and, and the simulation-based approach. And what, here is what we found. We found uh, in the context of uh, uh, evaluating the ideal clock sensing, a digital, twin, uh, a digital twin approach would be very effective. Uh, Notice that here, the digital twin I'm talking about, uh, here is a bit different uh, from the digital twin idea uh, the panelists talked about uh, earlier today. I think there is a good example of using digital twin <coughs> to do real-time identification of uh, incident and sign and sending the emergency vehicle. But we are talking about early concept evaluation. The idea is that as a civil engineer, you want to get some sense of uh, whether it's reasonable to put a what type of sensor, how many sensor, what's the res resolution range of the sensor at a particular location. So you want to get an uh, idea of, uh, you know, get some evidence to convince yourself this is the right way to do. So this is a uh, uh, whole idea behind this uh, digital twin approach. And what we're doing here is trying to sort of uh, feed in this you know, real-world data, like GIS data, dream video, video data, into the simulation. So you can have, a, I would say, realistic, but definitely not the same, same digital twin. Then you can generate back a sensing approach. And using that data, you can run your, perhaps, machine learning algorithm to do object detection, to do uh, traffic light control, because you, you can count how many vehicles in here in this section. So you can do all of the things through this digital domain. And uh, uh, the third challenge, uh, what we found is there's a lack of standardization um, when it comes to cloud sensing. Uh, many of you probably know there are already a lot of standardization in the world of B2X, um, but uh, when it comes to cloud sensing, I would say there is no con consensus formed because uh, if you look at a uh, standardization from the B2S community. Um, for example, uh, the ETSI in Europe, they published uh, uh, standardization on collective sensing service. They will tell you when it comes to sharing collective sensing data, they will, what they will tell you is that don't share raw data, share, have the, think about all those dots on the point called static by LIDAR. They say, well, 
don't share raw data because we don't have bandwidth. You should share the you know, process data with other entities. But if you look at the computer vision and machine learning field, people have been talking about we can you know, extract more value by sharing raw data. So there is a, sort of some difference between you know, uh, you know, opinion by people from different communities. We found that this interesting. Uh, one comment, lost time because I run out of time, but one comment I like to make is this. As we're defining new standards for target sensing, uh, not only we want to focus on you know, today, but also maybe tomorrow when we have 5G, so we have enough bandwidth to share more data, not only detecting objects, but also making maybe uh, having come up with other use cases to collect sensing. So that's all of my presentation today. Thank you so much.